Hello, hello, people. I am Javi Koe, also known as Baby Koe, joined by Steph Sabra. What up, bra? <laughs> My big Sabra. <laughs> oh, Super Sabra. That's what I was calling you on the on the live stream there. St- uh, Steph Super Sabra. Sometimes Jabby gets autocorrected to baby, and I'm just like, sure, why not? Hey, baby. Right, hey, hey, yourself. Never put baby in a corner. Exactly. What? Ain't that just the way it goes? So if you guys haven't already, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button, bell icon, all notifications, vote this up, let YouTube know you're enjoying what you're watching. We're looking at what the China-India border dispute is really about. From Bloomberg Quick Take Originals. Now, I know some of you take umbrage with Bloomberg's Quick Takes. <laughs> what is the name of the thing? So, uh, but I thought this would be an interesting subject to you know cover nonetheless. It's 20 minutes long, so I'm excited for some in-depth western splaining. <laughs> You know, like white splaining, yeah. man splaining, western splaining about the China India border dispute. Feel free to hit corrections in the comments below. You know, let us know what's inaccurate, what's accurate. And yeah, just let us know your feelings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get the point. So, uh, all right, let's jump into this. Here we go. The 2,400 kilometer long Himalayas include the highest peaks, beautiful landscapes, and some of the most contentious areas in the world. The mountainous region separates two rising superpowers that contain over a third of the planet's population. And there's a big problem. It's not well demarcated. Uh, There are not signposts everywhere. It's not even very well populated. Very few people live up there. It's very tricky to have a sense of who's controlling what bits of that. It's a very long border. Mm. And it's very easy for uh, accidents to happen. Accidents. Boundary disagreements led to a deadly military clash between the two sides for the first time since 1975. Adding to the border disputes is China's Belt and Road Initiative, a massive infrastructure project aimed at spreading Beijing's influence all over the globe, including countries which were at odds with India. We know that Pakistan is a big part of China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. We know that China has been investing in ports, they've been investing in roads in Pakistan. And India and Pakistan do share a very contentious relationship also. In response to all of this, India has increased military on the border, banned Chinese apps, and improved ties with strategic partners to try and prevent the spread of Chinese influence. India believes that China wants a unipolar Asia that is dominated by China, Mm -hmm. where China sets the rules of the road, and where countries acquiesce to Chinese needs and wants. India believes? Uh, It seems like there's very strong evidence to support this idea. (laughs) I mean, with everything we're seeing, I'm like, it's not just a belief. This is like, this is a fact. China's putting money in every single pot going, high influence. (laughs) Now TikTok. Yeah, now exactly. (laughs) That's China. Looking at what they are doing in Africa, you even just saw a second ago of the Indian guy next to the African guy. Oh, it's a U.S. guy. Yeah. Well, he is African, but African-American. Indian and American relations are improving. I think that's what that's about there. I wasn't looking at the flags initially. I had a different idea in my mind, which is that China's just buying up portions of Africa, so to speak. We talked about yeah. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. While a war may be unlikely, China has made it known it aims to take back what it sees as its territory. Xi Jinping has made it his goal to put China, what he says is the center stage of the world. And he's also said, you know, he wants China to stand tall in the world. I think with that sort of rhetoric, it it leaves very little room for China to be able to maneuver and give concessions. You hear about Nancy Pelosi? No. I'll tell you later. The late 1940s saw China's communists overthrow the ruling government to form what it is today, the People's Republic of China. And the hero of the revolution was Mao Zedong. That same decade, India gained independence from Great Britain to create their current democratic government. India was one of the first countries to uh, recognize the People's Republic of China. And they did have the first few years where India and China really did partner with each other uh, and saw each other as countries that could move forward together. There was a little bit of an Asia for Asians or India, China, uh, brothers kind of atmosphere, Mm. or at least friends. But that didn't last long. Shortly after establishing the People's Republic of China, the government exerted its control over Tibet. During the revolution in which the Chinese Communist Party 
took control of the country. In the late 50s, they then sent troops into Tibet to take control of that region, which had been semi-autonomous, semi-independent up until that point. As a result of that, the Dalai Lama uh, in 1959 fled to India, took refuge in India. That's right. The Dalai Lama declared that his escape would not have been possible without the loyal support of his people. Although they'd signed an agreement meant for both sides to respect each other's territorial integrity, India and China began to confront each other on the border. China became convinced then that not only was India at fault for accepting the Dalai Lama and these refugees, but also accused India of actually colluding with the US and the UK uh, to engineer his escape. And so by the early 60s, you really saw a relationship where there was very little trust and a sense that the agreement had essentially kind of broken down or as far as India was concerned, was not being uh, respected uh, by Beijing. So hold up. You're not letting us be a, a dictatorship. How dare you? <laughs> Means war. Friendships off. No more friendships. You're not welcome to our slumber parties anymore. Sounds like high school relationships. I know, right? I mean, that's exactly what politics is, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, Nancy Pelosi oh. is in uh, Taiwan right now. So by the end of recording this video, we might be at war with China. <laughs> No. I'm just oh yeah, is it about I'm hoping the, I'm, a I'm hoping it's a joke. Is it about the super chips or I don't know why she's go I don't even know why she's going to Taiwan, but China's like, "Yo, don't let Nancy Pelosi go to Taiwan. That's like an act of war." I'm obviously paraphrasing really badly, but they are seeing it as an aggressive move to recognize Taiwan as an independent state or an independent country when China does not want it to be recognized as independent from China. That's what's up. Wow. And so, yeah, little old Nancy Pelosi flying to Taiwan is going to you know, send World War III Three into action. Come home. Yeah. <laughs> the first skirmishes took place when India discovered China had been building roads through what it viewed as its territory. And just a few years later, the most significant border conflict occurred. The point at which India and China sort of disputes really reached their climax was in 1962 when the two sides fought a war. That's right. Over the same territory that they're fighting over now up in the Himalayas. Thousands died on both sides, with China reaching its goal of retaining a large area of land near northwestern India called Atsai Chin. Since then, there have been numerous conflicts along what's now the longest disputed border on the planet. The areas of contention? The northwestern Himalayan region known as Ladakh, the Doklam Plateau, a territory that intersects China, Bhutan and India, and Arunachal Pradesh, the eastern territory in India that China claims is part of southern Tibet. There have been borders drawn up by various British cartographers in the past. There's the Arda Johnson line marking the border in Ladakh, the McCartney MacDonald line, another proposed marking in Ladakh, and the McMahon line, which marks the border of Arunachal Pradesh. We have a, a definite cartographic vision about our boundaries based on what the British has thought about. It's based on a little bit of geography, a little bit of ethnicity, a little bit of history. So it's a very well-defined boundaries which has not been recognized by China. Although some British drawn lines were agreed upon by past governments in Tibet, they were never formally accepted by Beijing. And this is precisely where the clash is because uh, there's no settled line at the moment where both agree especially in these disputed areas in the north and the east where the actual border lies. This is so fascinating to me. The way the Chinese are being described here is like the, the pigeons in Finding Nemo. Mine, mine, yeah. mine. <laughs> like, like not recognizing any sort of lines or disputes or anything. Like India is breaking down like, look, ethnicity, what the Brits did, and then et cetera, et cetera. China just like, nope, don't see it. What are you talking about? Oh, that's ours. That's ours too. That All that's ours. We want it. Exactly. I'm like, God damn. <sighs> Calm down. You know what I wondered about while they were describing that was, and because I, I was tempted to Google it, but I won't, which is the size of China versus the size of India. Mm. In my mind, Mine, just because of the maps I've been exposed to growing up, India looks small compared to China, and yet China wants more, <laughs> more, more territory. I'm like, golly. Totally. I don't know exactly what it is, but I always look at China as like significantly yeah. larger than India. Yeah. But there have been many periods since the 1962 war where there wasn't conflict. Mm, nice. What they did between 1993. Uh, and 2012, 2013, in the two decade period, they set up a series of agreement which essentially established that a lot of those territories that both countries claim uh, would be both man's land, so to mm. speak. Uh, neither side uh, would disturb the status quo. Both sides would get to patrol those regions. 
and both sides would not establish a permanent presence in the region. Mm. This solution is known as the line of actual control, and it's a temporary border where both sides maintain the status quo. But even that line's location isn't fully agreed upon. In 2013, a dispute occurred in the Demchok Valley near Ladakh, and another in 2015, where Indian soldiers destroyed a Chinese-built structure in what they saw as their territory. Then things really started to heat up near the Dokland Plateau. There was one boundary crisis in 2017, where it actually involved the boundary dispute between China and Bhutan, uh, which again, it's not quite demarcated, but there's an understanding about it. Uh, India as an ally of Bhutan got involved uh, to help push China back or get it to reverse its movement or its unilateral change of the status quo there. China brought heavy road building equipment into the disputed region and began constructing a road, one that would give China a direct route to the Siliguri Corridor, or Chicken's Neck, where all land-based military and commercial traffic travel between India's northeastern provinces and the rest of the country. Mm. So if there ever is a war or a major conflict between China and India, uh, this would be strategically significant land. Bhutan allowed India's military to enter their country to stop the construction. For months the troops faced off, but no casualties were reported. Mm. That's scary. Hmm. How could there be no casualties? After that incident, India... If you've ever seen two Brits fight on a subway, you'll understand what no casualties looks like. <laughs> That was a weird reference that popped into my head. I thought the same thing when I was in England is the short of it. I was on a subway or on the on the tube and these two Brits got in each other's faces like, you pushed me, no I didn't, no I didn't. You pushed me, you pushed me. They just kept escalating, escalating. I'm like, oh, it's about to get juicy up in this bitch. And then <laughs> you know? nothing. And they just went, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they just <laughs> settled into their corners and I was like, what the f I was expecting something to go down. But with, with this in particular, I think that both sides were ordered not to make a move. Oh, okay. Because that could lead to a major full escalation. Blown war, yeah, yeah, full blown, you know, conflict between the two countries. I can see why, like, you stand down. St everyone's yeah. saying, like, stand down. Do not fire first. Okay. You know? Yeah. Very tense. And China appear to have put their differences behind them. China's relationship with India. Uh, that had sort of looked promising. As recently as 2019, Xi Jinping traveled to India, had this two-day summit with Modi. And just before that, Modi came to China and had a multi-day summit with Xi Jinping here. The two countries were, were sort of finding a common ground where they could work together. India and China had actually established economic ties, well, perhaps at their greatest point uh, in history. Um, China had become India's largest trading partner, but you also saw Chinese investment for the first time going into India in a significant way, and China was seeking uh, to enter in an even bigger way, and particularly in India's uh, telecommunications sector and the 5G network. Then, in 2020, the pandemic happened. The breaking news is about the confirmed coronavirus in Kerala. When a student studying in China's Wuhan University has tested positive with the deadly virus. Because of China's handling of COVID, India started becoming concerned uh, about its over-dependence on China in certain sectors, mm -hmm. uh, the lack of transparency uh, of certain Chinese companies, their links with the state. Um, and whether the Chinese state would use its economic ties for whether it was coercion or economic influence. Up until this point, most of the standoffs had been non-violent because of agreements between both sides not to use firearms. The majority of the confrontations during the 20th century used loudspeakers to taunt each other from far away. Chinese troops have set up Psychological warfare. that out Punjabi numbers at their forward posts. Let's take a look. Wait, is this the music playing from India? They Soon after that. the pandemic broke out, the border confrontations turned deadly. Oh man. In May 2020, China surprised India by deploying troops in the disputed region of Ladakh and Pakistani occupied Kashmir. Oh boy. China says India's recent construction of roads, tunnels, and the refurbishment of airfields in the area along the border changed the status quo and forced China to respond. After weeks of skirmishes, 20 Indian soldiers and at least four Chinese soldiers died in hand-to-hand -hand combat. What? And it came at a time when economic relations between the two countries were at its peak. 
This is a question that continues to baffle a number of experts who focus both on China and India. Why would Beijing essentially put at stake uh, a relationship with India that has been uh, growing in importance and that China has in part pursued uh, to keep a country like India away from its main adversary, the US? Why would China put this at risk? Um, and the answers that uh, we have had are kind of uh, twofold. Uh, one, they believed that this was a tactically significant pieces of territory uh, and that they did not anticipate the backlash from India. They thought, like in other parts of Asia, uh, that they would essentially establish their claims, then India would accept that and that they would go and back. India would just roll yeah, over? Yeah. <laughs> Although the confrontation ended, building along the border didn't. In early 2021, China completed the construction of a new village high in the mountains near the Dokkan Plateau called Pangda, the latest addition to a handful of villages China has built to fortify the Tibetan borderlands. But there's another problem. Some of these villages are located inside land claimed by Bhutan. It's the classic. You know what I'm sort of stuck on is that instance of the, um, the news footage where the lady was like, oh, it's all India's fault. It made me wonder for a moment because I had this fleeting feeling of like, man, is it just all propaganda over there? You know, kind of like Russia, because I had asked myself, how can Vladimir Putin convince all those people to invade Ukraine? From my limited understanding was that there's really only like three channels in Russia. Mm -hmm. I think there's only like three channels and it's all propaganda. Yeah. You have everything filtered through a single network because over here we have a variety of apps, whereas in China, it's like all one centralized app and you do everything there between your chatting, your shopping, your, you know, booking your Uber or whatever. Everything is done through this single singular app so the government can spy on you. My impression was it's all propaganda but then i have to ask myself well how much of our news is propaganda and so there's a spectrum of like truth to propaganda truth to jingoism right and i get messed up because i'm like how do i know what i know how do i know what i know is true every country has at least some degree of propaganda going on i'd like to think america isn't hit as hard with it because we have such conflict just in our people and our politics we, we are not unified at all mm. so i'm like how is it how is, how is there propaganda if we're not unified but then i realize we have propaganda of the left and propaganda of the right and it's just combating constantly so yeah the only difference is we can say when our president sucks publicly <laughs> yeah and out loud yeah you can't do that in china you can't do that yeah. or russia or russia in by bhutan it's the classic possession is nine tenths of the law phenomena it is china saying we're just going to change facts on the ground yeah. Yeah. establish a presence and the idea has been that nobody will push back experts refer to their tactic as salami slicing and it reflects hmm. the wider strategy of china's leader xi jinping to assert the country's territorial claims in small steps while not addressing it head on uh, China's overall strategy for a lot of things, and I'm extrapolating at this point to include the border, is to try and push questions that cannot be resolved today into the future. Mm -hmm. and, and the thought behind that is that uh, any issue that China has to tackle today, if it can tackle it in five, ten years down the road, China will be in a stronger position at that point. China's end goal is unknown. But considering the sparsely populated, inaccessible areas along the border, the reasons for claiming new territory seem to be less about wanting the land for economic or strategic military reasons. There are other explanations, of which the primary one is that Xi Jinping and the Communist Party of China wants to prove to their own public that even though they had made some missteps at home in terms of handling COVID, they could help take over these territories or establish their presence in territories that China claims on their sovereignty grounds. And so essentially this was a nationalism uh, argument. China's obviously become much more assertive in its territorial claims. I think a lot of people have talked about this wolf warrior diplomacy where Chinese diplomats are much more aggressive in verbally defending, rhetorically defending China's position. China's obviously backed that up with more military spending. But you've also seen it reflected in Chinese state media. They go to greater lengths to celebrate Chinese military accomplishments. They go to greater lengths to show that uh, Chinese territorial claims are being upheld and defended. Oh, well, I mean, I think we all do that. Vladimir Putin was doing the same thing with Russia, even though they were, there were a lot of casualties with um, Ukraine. Right. We did the same thing when we hit Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. and we took down Saddam Hussein. We're like, ah, look, everyone's cheering. But very few people were actually happy about that at the time. Right. There was something interesting I had learned, which is um, and please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. But like there was a kid, a picture of a kid doing a thumbs up. Like, see, he, he's happy. Saddam Hussein is, you know, down. But apparently thumbs up is actually means F you in, yeah. that, in that area. I'm a little bit confused by what they are 
arguing. Yeah, you know, the point that they're making, which is this is all for, you know, the pride of the people and, and showing the people we're doing the right thing. And I'm like, so they're just trying to combat uprising. That's what this is about, because I feel like that doesn't seem right to me. I don't know. Maybe with China dealing with Hong Kong and with with Taiwan at the same time and all this stuff and people being like, you know, not feeling comfortable anymore, you know, being suppressed. Maybe they are com- trying to combat uprising. But to me, when I was like analyzing it from my ignorant perspective, I'm like, it just seems to me like they're, it's just economic and military. That's yeah. it. You know, military strategy because they're trying to prepare for a potential attack later on. It's hard to put myself in the people of China's position because A, it's Eastern civilization. B, it, they've been raised under a communist regime for this long. But it's like, I can imagine instead of them sending out soldiers to combat a peaceful place of nature that they've made unpeaceful, they would want to be fed, yeah. And sheltered, yeah, <laughs> and cared for. Like, imagine that resources going directly to your people. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, exactly. I suppose China was dealing with some bullshit at the time because I remember how all the footage that came out when coronavirus first hit. And people were just sort of stuck in their homes and people were looking at China like, oh, my God, how are they doing this to their people? And mm-hmm. it's just the treatment of their own citizens when coronavirus first hit. And then the rest of us went into lockdown, too. But, yeah. you know, it, it just wasn't a good look and people weren't happy. Even now, there is like uh, protests and whatnot because of the ill treatment that people are like the reason why yeah, you, know, you know about the iPhone, right? Yeah. Like the iPhone factory and all that. So can you imagine being in such beautiful nature? First of all, destroying it by yeah. building stuff and then killing people. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you're in the most beautiful landscapes in the world. Yeah. That happens a lot, actually. It's like, yeah. It happens all the time. It's, it's sad. And one of the areas they were fighting about, it looked like... um forgot if it was Tibetan monks or something like that. It was just monks living mm-hmm. in the hills and whatnot who were very isolated. People who are just isolated from modern civilization, just living their lives, are being pulled into this weird conflict because of this road. When it's like, they're a peaceful indigenous people and you're interfering with their life. That's silly. It's, yeah. Yeah. In the South China Sea, few are willing to fight back China's claims, but India is different. <laughs> the problems in the South China Sea, including a number of different claimants who are smaller, perhaps not willing or able to take China on, those don't relate to the China-India situation, uh, where India has the ability to hold its ground. Good. That's South, South China India Sea. Lags behind- that South China Sea situation is bad. I don't know if I explained that to you already, but it's not good. <laughs> I'll explain later. That's with the pearls, right? The pearl yes. Tra- yeah. yeah. In China, in terms of military, technology, and infrastructure it may be one of the few countries willing to contest China in the region. India has already opposed China's Belt and Road Initiative, which some estimate involves as much as $8 trillion aimed at creating economic ties all over the globe. It was one of the first major countries uh, to announce that it was going to boycott the first Belt and Road Forum. And it does not do so because it says Uh, that it does not respect uh, standards like financial sustainability, environmental sustainability, uh, transparency, uh, and territorial integrity. That last bit is important for India, uh, and one of the key reasons it does not uh, subscribe to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, India believes that China, through its China-Pakistan economic corridor, uh, has established projects in what India considers disputed territory between India and Pakistan. It's likely that India will continue to boycott uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, for the near future. China's handling of COVID, the border crisis, and the Belt and Road have all led India to look elsewhere for economic ties, determined to become less reliant on China. Good. After the 2020 flare-ups, India banned dozens of Chinese apps, and Prime Minister Modi... What is with those eyes? What the hell is that? Did you see it? Uh Uh-uh. Right there. Oh, whoa. What's that about? Is that like some V for Vendetta type? I have no idea. I'm all about the revolution. I just noticed it right there. I was like, what the hell is that about? After the 2020 flare-ups, India banned dozens of Chinese apps, and Prime Minister Modi doubled down on the Quad, an association of four democracies, Australia, Japan, India, and the US, committed to preventing the Indo-Pacific from becoming Beijing's geopolitical domain cemented a group of strong democracies that will work together going forward to secure a free and open Indo-Pacific. And this is great news for the U.S., who's looked to increase ties with India for decades. U.S. policymakers have seen India as a geopolitical counterbalance, an economic alternative, and a democratic contrast to China. Uh, Even if it's not an ally, um, and the fact that it does have a rivalry with China, that China would have to dedicate a certain amount of its own resources 
uh, in defending against India or in tackling India. And so that in and of itself could uh, help with the balance of power uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And therefore, they have also talked about uh, not just uh, approving of India's rise, but it is in U.S. national security interest mm -hmm. to support uh, India's yep. rise. Yep. If you look at India, the pace of growth, the size of the population, it's a huge market. You have Chinese companies like TikTok, Huawei, all of which thought they were going to have big businesses in India, and that's obviously changed in the recent past. Although India has a history of non-alignment dating back from the Cold War, the intense standoff in recent years may have finally pushed them to choose sides. Yeah. The US and India have a lot to gain if they can hold the line against China, and much to lose if they can't. Mm. I think the, the Chinese do see as the greater issue here, India sort of forming this alliance with the US, joining the Quad. I think Beijing is calibrating its response to the borders dispute to try and to defend its territorial claims, but also not to do so much that it pushes India into the American embrace. We will work together closer than ever before. The best case scenario for how this plays out between India and China is they resolve the border dispute, uh, they pull their troops back, trade resumes, but I think that that is also a very unlikely outcome. Given the, the recent Indian participation in the Quad, uh, given how uh, much effort the U.S. has put into strengthening that relationship and how poorly the relationship between China and the U.S. has gone, it does seem uh, unlikely that India and China are going to have happy days anytime soon. That's crazy. The military is using the Steam Deck. What's that? Oh it's a video God. game system. Uh, it's very interesting how like one to one sometimes video games can yeah. be with military stuff. Art imitates life. Yeah, it's true. That's just easier. Like if you're already playing video games, might as well make it easier for the, your soldiers to yeah. access this equipment. Anyway, the notion that uh, China will somehow resolve its uh, conflicts with India in an effort to de-escalate the bonding of India and America. I really hope that India sees through that because if China goes, oh, we're frenzies now. Friendships. I feel like China's long-term plan is to eventually walk back on that and renege any agreements in order to just continue to expand their power. It seems like that's what they've been doing. Like they're using the apology later type thing. Like yeah. just do it and they apologize if it's wrong yeah. and building their own rules. And it's like, it's tough because you're working with cultures and people and most cultures are like this where there is so much pride involved. They're not gonna walk back on what they've done. I yeah. mean, that would be amazing. I hope that day comes, but. Yeah, no, unlikely. Unlikely. Too much face saving. Yeah. Um, Manly. <laughs> No, that's just how it is, yeah. To me, China's like the new Britain, in a way. They're just a little bit more strategic about it. Because I was listening to some video by a historian, a YouTube historian the other day, talking about General Cornwallis. He affected both America and India, apparently. Hearing him talk about the history of England with India and all that stuff, it's just like, it's interesting the kind of relationships that England made and the agreements that England made. Not just with India, but other places, even in Europe, where they're going, oh yeah, 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 we cool, we cool. I'll do this, we'll do this. And then immediately walk back on that once the agreements are in place. And so now you see China doing the same thing here. It's scary. Yeah. Yeah, so you can just say whatever yeah. and then hope that, like they were saying in this, enough time goes by yeah. where you build progress and then are like, oh, we didn't know. It's kind of scary how often Asians have lied through history. Like Japan was supposed to be in a peace agreement with the states when they attacked Pearl Harbor. I know, I'm like, my people, what's going on? We're supposed to be the chill, quiet ones. <laughs> yeah. It's not like that. Well, you're chill and quiet now because of Nagasaki. <laughs> yeah, well, honestly, I'll say this. Go off Japan. I love what we've done. We knew we were way out of line in yeah. World War II. Yeah. And now we're very, like, we're chill yeah. comparatively. Comparatively, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Have you learned, you've hopefully learned comparatively. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was quite informative. Uh, if there's any inaccuracies, I would love to know from you guys in the comments below. Um, I thought that was like eye-opening to a certain degree. It was interesting to me the notion, like the most startling thing to me was the notion that this was not all just economics and military, but it was also about giving reassurances to their own people. That kind of blew my mind because China, the Chinese government strikes me as the kind of government that couldn't give two shits about what its people think or feel. You got to do what you got to do to keep them in order. Right? Keep yeah. In line. That's the scariest part about governing peoples and access to information. You can create an entire dream world of their reality yeah. based on what you're telling them from birth on. Yeah. And that's such a tight grip of control. And then you see people who act against it, like try to get information journalism, journalists, and then they're killed. Yeah. And it's so like, you want to fall in line. And it, scares me for the future of the people because I'm like, how do you get out of that? Keep them occupied. You avoid a repeat of Mussolini by keeping keeping them occupied with apps. 
How did we get some of this footage though? Like of the propaganda footage maybe? Okay. And it just gets circulated somehow. Like it's impossible to keep anything contained these mm -hmm. days. Somehow it'll get out. Yeah. I mean, there's footage that just got out of Trump rehearsing one of his addresses to the people. Oh yeah. You know, and, and it's like all the these- before, After the January 6th? Yeah, it was or, Yeah, it was either right before or after the January 6th incident. And these outtakes somehow were made public. And I'm like, how, who, how does that footage get out? If the footage of the president messing up before going live gets out, none of us are safe. Trust no one. <laughs> You know, I mean, footage of Obama calling uh, Kanye West a jackass got out, and that was like whenever Obama was president. Years that was years ago, right? Yeah. It was in, early on in his presidency. Now this footage of of Trump gets out of him screwing up, not being able to say a few words. I'm like, wow. So you know, to answer your question, I'm like, eh, it's not a surprise to me. Nothing is contained anymore. So drones. Drones. Everything's leaked. You guys, thanks so much for hanging out. Hopefully you enjoy that. And uh, subscribe, bell icon, all notifications, vote this up. I'm Jabby Koi. This is Steph Sabra. Peace out.